Now, everyone, everyone I know loves beef burgundy. And if you ever tried to make beef burgundy and it ended up tasting whiny or tough or dry or generally disappointing, then this video is for you. discuss the most common mistakes chefs and cooks make when they cook beef burgundy. I will tell you closely guarded secrets and techniques only the best French chefs in the world know. So that you cook beef burgundy or beef bourguignon like a Michelin star chef in your own kitchen. Who am I? My name is Walter Trapp. I'm Richard from Austria and I used to manage and own some of the best restaurants and most highly awarded restaurants in Europe. And beef burgundy is essentially beef that is slowly cooked in Burgundian red wine until it's so soft, so sticky and so deliciously savory that it is considered the king of all slow cooks, followed only by dope de boeuf. What's the difference between beef burgundy and dope de boeuf? Well, for a start, they are both very similar to outside of the French cooking, but the, to the French, oi, 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 you, you come across what I just said, now they look like a peasant. The French can be very, very complicated in particular when it comes to their food. So beef burgundy is obviously made with Burgundian red wines and it also has lots and lots of mushrooms in it because mushrooms are another key ingredient in burgundy. Dope de boeuf on the other hand can be made exactly like beef burgundy but it can make use of other wines from other regions and it can be red or it can be white and dope de boeuf often contains much more spices like orange, cloves, prunes as well as as olives. I mean it really depends on the region where it is made. Burgundy is also the home to the distinctive white chowley car with chowley like limousine beef they're muscular they're big it takes them several years of age to fully grow. Now these cows are not great for steaks but they're brilliant for slow cooking and that's where your first problem lies if you get meat from an Angus cow you know which is much younger which is the dominant cow breed all over the world. If you're in the US, Canada, South America, England, Australia, you will have Angus cow plenty. And everyone loves it and it's great for cooking steak, but it's not so good for slow cooking. Generally, lots of cuts of Angus cows fall apart due to the lack of age and less developed connective tissue. So my tip is, if you're not sure what cut of beef you use, you go for beef chicks. No matter what the breed is, they can come from an Angus cow and they will always be brilliant because cows use their cheeks the most. It's the most worked muscles and they are just such a perfect vehicle for beef bourguignon or beef burgundy or dope de boeuf. So should you marinate the meat or not? I know a lot of recipes tell you that you should do that but you're probably better off not marinating it. The wine can make your meat oxidize and give it quite a gamey flavor. The acid of the wine will also dry the meat which makes it more difficult to cook later on and browning the meat is another issue because the meat is so wet and if you not marinate the meat you actually have the advantage that the meat maintains its original meat flavor while the sauce is having its own flavor and then when you put them in the dish they're perfectly matched together. If you want to know more about that, check out my video on the importance of sauce when you match your food with wine. Okay, let's start cooking. Now, have you ever heard a story that slow cooked meats taste better the next day? Well, it has to do with some chemistry that's going on inside the meat. And I'll tell you about it when we get there and when you add the butter, the butter gets the slightest brown color, that's when you add your meat. And then you do not stir the meat because you just let it sit so it completely browns on one side. That's what I want to do. Then when it's completely brown, I turn it over. 
and I do that until the meat is brown on all sides and then I start the stirring process. Now you will notice in the beginning when the meat is quite wet that the juices keep washing away the browning of the pot and that's great. Eventually the meat cannot do that anymore and that's when you're going to have to switch over to deglazing. In case you've got meat that starts to release a lot of water then you do nothing and you walk away and you let those fluids cook away. Don't throw them out, don't discard them, they're protein juices. Now once you then basically walk away and then you hear the sizzling noises going on again, that's when you return to your meat and you start cooking it exactly what you see right now. So if it basically means there's a lot of water comes out and you got sheep meat from a feedlot. Now keep frying till the meat is as brown as you can get it. This is basically building your gravy. Next you start building layers and layers of flavor into your sauce and you do that by deglazing. So a splash of wine, scrape the pot clean, let the wine cook away, go back to frying, fry it as dark as you can, basically just before burning. Then deglaze again, fry again. Repeat this process two or three times and you build a lot of, lot of levels of flavors into your sauce. Now the final deglazing happens when you add the vegetables. Vegetables when in contact with heat will release the water and that basically deglazes you in the pan once again. And next you add the wine and lots of it, lots of wine. In French cooking you you always need two to three bottles of wine. Now one or two bottles go to the pot and one bottle goes to the chef. Make some port wine, some orange zest, so you see I'm going a bit into the dope de boeuf direction. Some peppercorns, some thyme. I'm sure you noticed I did not add any flour onto my meat and that's another tip I give you. I did that deliberate. Most of us get the amount of flour wrong and you add too much flour and the sauce becomes like liquid plaster. Plus if you add the flour you will have another huge problem because the tiny flour particles will constantly sink to the bottom of the pot and get stuck there leading to the pot constantly burning. You're much better off thickening the sauce later on which I will show you towards the end of the video. So next you cover the pot with a lid and you simmer it for two to three hours on a low heat. Now the cooking time very much depends on the, how developed the connective tissue or how old your cow was. As older the cow the more connective tissue it will have. The connective tissue are tendon, so silver skin and when simmered for hours they soften and they break down and they develop a texture that is simultaneously gelatinous and creamy. Although connective tissue starts to break down at 68 degrees Celsius it takes a long cooking time for the collagen to actually break apart and reform into gelatin, you know, giving sort of succulents to the dehydrating meat and convert a so-called tough cut of meat into a melt in your mouth delight meat, if that makes sense. The other substance in tendons is elastin. You probably noticed that the gelatin don't completely dissolves. Elastin does not break down under normal cooking temperatures, so it needs much higher temperatures. So elastin will remain in the meat in form of gristle, if that makes sense, but it's very healthy too. During all the time, the gelatins from the meat, as they keep breaking down, they dissolve themselves into the cooking liquid, they thicken the gravy, they emulsify the of the flavor rich fats and to that they create this luscious silken gravy which is so so good which you only have in slow cooks. So that's our meat ready. Now I have a lot of gravy still in the pot. I take the meat out, I check it for doneness. The meat is ready if it's soft. The connective tissue needs to be so soft that it is a, a stage of complete breakdown. That's when the collagen melts and starts oozing between the dry meat fibers and it lubricates them. Now it makes your meat shiny, it makes your meat juicy. 
if done, then you take it out and then you reduce the sauce, you can salt it, you can thicken it with a mixture of one part of butter, one part of flour, which is called Bermani. For that, you need to bring the sauce to the boil, you add a little bit, you let it fully dissolve, and then you bring it to the boil again before adding more. If you keep adding without boiling, uh, it can easily end up with a sauce that is as thick as liquid plaster. Um, once your sauce is perfect, you put the meat back and then you make a burger and garnish. So I take some shallots or I take some pearl onions. I add to it the bacon lardons and I fry them till golden brown. And then for the last two or three minutes of cooking, I add some button mushrooms and I cook that all up. And then I finish it off with some parsley and then I sprinkle that over my beef burgundy. Done. Wow, it looks so nice, doesn't it? Oh. I forgot to tell you about why slow cooks better the next day. Well, I haven't told you that yet, but I do now. If you want to have a better result, you need to let your meat cool down in the cooking liquor. This will make the meat moister and more juicy because gelatins from the gravy are basically absorbed back into the meat, making the meat firmer and even more succulent when you reheat it. So you need to cool it, you need to chill it, and then you need to ring it, and meat's gonna be much better. Mm. Now that's a perfect dish for great wine. So what wine would you choose? Well, it should be the same great variety that you put into your gravy. So check out my video on how to match food with wines through the sauce, and you get much, much more answers. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to seeing you next time.